Welcome to the Discover Alaska Lecture Series, brought to you by the University of Alaska's Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. My name is Althea St. Martin, and I will be your host for this summer series. Discover Alaska is in its 15th season and was held on the UAF campus in past summers. The COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines required that we rethink the format for the series this summer. We are delighted that KUAC has agreed to support this new format for the series as a weekly TV broadcast. Thank you, KUAC. Each Wednesday night over the course of the summer, KUAC will air a talk by a local community member on a range of Alaskan topics. We're grateful to our speakers who were incredibly flexible in adjusting to this new format and appreciate the time they are donating to help us all learn more about our great state. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to let you know that you can view and share the talk online later by going to UAF Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Sharon McLeod. She will share with us her experiences, homesteading, lessons in planning ahead while living in the moment. Ms. McLeod retired after 33 years with Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities, and she has also spent 25 years as a big game guide in Alaska. Tonight, she will share her family's experiences living on a homestead on the Glen Highway, beginning in 1950, just as the road was being paved. In a home without electricity or running water, without nearby stores or even a school close enough to attend, their family persevered. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing your homesteading experience with us tonight on Discover Alaska. Hi, I'm Sharon McLeod. I got asked by Discover Alaska to talk about my experiences growing up on a homestead and how everything that we learned there helped my sisters and I pre get prepared for life because there you're kind of living in the moment, but you're also having to plan ahead and you have to be able to take a left turn when a left turn happens because everything is unpredictable and unexpected. My parents came up from Michigan. We got to Alaska when I was nine months old and I think they were pretty brave because leaving Michigan to Alaska where the Alaska Highway had just barely been opened and they had no clue what they were going to. They were hoping to do farming in the Palmer Wasilla area, but all the farmland was taken. So we ended up on the Glen Highway. And here you can see the trip wasn't all peaches and cream. The, there were several equipment problems. My dad had to fix a gas leak. He had to fix a rear end and transmission. He actually had to leave me and my mom at some little roadhouse while he clanked back to where there was a mechanic to have the truck worked on and so that he could also work on it. So here we are in Alaska. That's the homestead. That's at mile 163 and a half Glen Highway. In the background, there's a, the Shugash Mountain Range and Taslina Lake. And if you went 60 miles straight, you would end up in Valdez going cross country. It's much farther by road, probably 140 miles from there. And off to the left, of the house that you can see is a, what really attracted my dad, being a mechanic, was a grease pit. He could drive onto it and change oil and all the fluids on the vehicles. The house is um, a remnant from the Alaska Road Commission. That was one of their camps and that's why the whole area was so flat and so well graveled. What we discovered later is it grew rocks way better than it did most vegetables. Here is the um, Ford Ferguson tractor and the clee track that my parents brought up with them in the first load. That shack, shanty, is truly kind of a shanty. Uh, my dresser drawer, my, my bed was a dresser drawer and it leaked so that they would have to put, hang buckets over the dresser drawer when I was sleeping. Here's my dad, he's the one walking to the side. The other two fellows were friends of theirs who came up with them. That's the clee track hauling logs out of the woods to build the foundation and then also make the boards. My dad had gone back to Michigan to pick up a planer and an edger and the sawmill. So he left me and my mom and did a quick round trip. We stayed there by ourselves while he was gone back to Michigan. 
Here's the sawmill actually operating. He had a flathead eight Buick engine in it that just purred. What a fabulous engine. And you can see the log was fairly large. Um, and the piles of sawdust went to good use. Um, we had an ice box and we would cut ice every summer. We had an ice house and the sawdust was what insulated the ice, hopefully for it to last until the next winter. If it didn't last, we ended up going to toward Valdez because there was ice you could get out of the old Keystone Tunnel and from Worthington Glacier. Here you can see the sawmill crew is, um, they've, um, they've cleared the ramp of logs and they're taking a break. Here you can see the house logs are partway up and the smoke is just chuffing out of the chimney from the house, the shanty in the back. Here are a couple of pictures. The roof is starting to go on. And that's me. I'm sure I was a big help at that point. And there is the log house with a shanty in front of it. That, that thing actually moved a couple of different times to the neighbors for them to live in. So here you have, to the far left is the Ford Ferguson. And it has, it's hard to tell, but there's a, um, a wood saw on it that you lay the logs on it, push it toward the, the blade, and you could cut stove lo stove logs whether for the wood cook stove in the kitchen or the barrel stove in the living room to the proper length and the building to the far right is what is called the powerhouse that's where the generator lived and the generator came on to do laundry with the old-fashioned ringer washer and it came on whenever power tools were needed or my mom had a bunch of sewing projects with a sewing machine and Here's the house with no insulation yet in the attic. You can tell by the icicles hanging off. And then there's the house. Mom's pulling me on a sled. And this is going to change from black and white to color because this is what the house looks like today. And you can see how much the trees have grown around it. And there we are. These are the neighbors that lived across the road and up the road. And among them all, they built our log house, the log house across the road, and the log house about a third of a mile up the road. Here's me helping again. My foot is stuck in the logs. And you can see the big pile of sawdust in the back. Actually, that pile of sawdust would disappear because the um, Alaska Road Commission would sometimes use it for different things, and they'd come get a load. And then we would get cases of... Um, of goods, including eggs that lived in our Roberta's in my closet, my sister's in my closet, because it was cool. Come springtime though, those eggs could be seriously rotten and my mom would break them individually into a separate cup when she was baking so she wouldn't ruin everything that she had. When they got really bad, when they were black and green, we would bury them in the sawdust and then our entertainment in the evenings was watching the grizzly bears come dig it up and roll in it. It was an interesting life. And here we are. My dad and I, he's pulling a load of kitchen wood for the wood cook stove. Here's the living room porch, and that's where you can, we sat out there in the evenings a lot, but those two posts that you see, in the wintertime, those were stacked high with um, split wood for the barrel stove because the, the door going into the house, that's heading right straight into the living room. And it was my sister's and my job to chop that wood. Right quick, you learn that spruce splits best at about 20 below with a wedge and a sledgehammer. There, my dad has taken off someplace and I wasn't happy that he was leaving. That's the, the Dodge truck that they drove to Alaska with. There's my mom and my dad. And there I am in a dress. Water, there was a creek down the house, down the hill from the house a little ways, and we frequently got water by the bucket full there. Sometimes we would take um, a wagon and pull some five gallon cans up, and eventually we got sort of running water. There's my dad and I. There was a lot of wild game around. In the wintertime, there were a pair of brothers also from Michigan who had ran a trap line, they went from the Glen Highway out toward Crosswind Lake, and that lake trout is one that they brought us from when they were on their trap line and then fishing. And then we shot a lot of spruce gouse. We had those for supper. There were both spruce grouse and ptarmigan. This was a coyote that was hanging out that 
got <laughs> got went away, I guess you'd say. There's my mom with a homemade wheelbarrow. That's what we would use sometimes for the gallons of water and sometimes we would also use it for hauling wood. Here I am, 1953, 110 in the sun and I have my coonskin cap on. Okay, the interior of the house, it, it progressed over the years. It was um, bare three-sided logs and a plank floor to begin with and that rug was braided by my mom. A few years later, there's shiplap on the walls and planking on the floor. The slippers on our feet are beaded moosehide slippers from the local Atna folks. The table here is one that my dad made. The boards are from one of the big logs for the tabletop, and then the legs are diamond willow. The, my mom made the curtains, and my, between she and my dad, they manufactured the valance above the window. And the spit cake, spit caca actually, is from my mom's aunts in Sweden. That was a delight every Christmas. And here we are. You can't see the light extremely well, but if you look on top of the cupboard, which my dad made, in the window is an Aladdin lamp. Most of our, our lighting was either by a pump-up Coleman lamp, where the pump was a separate one. They had copper bottoms, and they're probably foot and a half tall with two mantles, and those were what provided us with our, our light in the wintertime. And there was also, we did a lot of, the, the generator would start when people needed to iron, and I'm gonna move because the other thing that we ironed with is a Coleman iron. The fuel goes in here, you pump it up here, you light it and the flames come out the bottom side and that's what you would use to iron. And I can tell you in the winter time, that was the favorite job. In the summertime, it was really not the favorite job because it was hot. So in this picture, what you see in the truck in the back are water barrels. We use those for hauling water from lakes nearby, or when the lakes froze up and we couldn't chop a hole, my dad would go to Glen Allen and get water. He worked for the Alaska Road Commission and they had, it was the general watering place for the entire area. And the water getting process was serious. You can see uh, right above the head of me sitting in the wagon are some pipes coming down from the house. We had a 300 gallon galvanized farm tank up there that gave us running water. But what we had to do, especially in the winter, was bring the pump in to get it warm, bring the hoses in to get them warm because back then there wasn't anything that was built to be flexible in the cold. So for two days when my mom was cooking, those hoses and the pump would be sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor. Then we had to remember to save enough water ahead of time. We'd have one kettle for boiling to thaw the bungs on the barrels because they would freeze solid coming 25 miles from Glen Allen. And then we had to prime the pump and we had to have a person standing on top of the barrels to move the hose from one barrel to the next fast so you don't lose the prime. And we had a person stationed at the tank another at the top of the folding's attic stairway and another at the door to holler stop when it was getting too full because overflowing would have meant it would have ended up on top of the wood stove and in the kitchen wood box and that would have been just bad berries. So what you're seeing in the wagon, the kid, that's me sitting there, there's a um, can, that's a five gallon Crisco can. When we ordered case goods, it was in the large lots and we got 50 and 100 pound sacks of, shou of sugar and flour and the five, the five gallon cans of Crisco. And what would happen with those five gallon cans is once they were emptied, they would get washed out and then they would become kind of what, after we grew up, we decided it was a freezer condo because Whenever we would get a moose, it would, especially a second season moose in November, it would hang in the meat house and be frozen. If we needed meat, my mom would bring in, or my dad, a hind quarter or a set of ribs, and it would hang in Roberta's in my bedroom <clears throat> and drip into a double laundry tub while it thawed. Then it would get cut up into different 
things like roast steaks, things for burgers, stew meat, packaged. And then it went in that can to be frozen again until we were ready to use it. This next slide shows that was a bad winter. There was a lot of snow. But the blue arrow is pointing to those um, the water pipes that go up to the attic to where the galvanized tank was. And I really wish we had pictures of some of that stuff, but my parents were more into taking pictures of us than stuff. This is one of the fellows from Michigan that hunted with my dad a lot. There we are, my sister and I, ragamuffins berry picking. There were good blueberries, good raspberries, currants, and that sort of thing, cranberries also. Um, my mom made all her bread, and what you're seeing here is my sister sitting in the bread bowl. It was a multi-purpose tool for us. We also used it to help wax the floors. Mom kind of devised a game. She made a, um, from an old bedspread, she made a holder for the, for the bread bowl, and when we were waxing the floor, she would give us first dibs at it because we would sling each other around in that bowl. And she made sure that the edges of it were pad padded, so if it hit the wall, it didn't hurt the boards. Here we are, midsummer bath in an aluminum wash tub. And as it turns out, we, um, we had probably the first indoor, true indoor bathroom in the neighborhood. Um, everybody had an outhouse. Ours was a two-seater, a high one for the adults and a low one for the kids. And I'm going to turn around and read this because it's just... It's, an, it's a statement of the times in the neighborhood, I think. So what my mom is talking about is we had a, uh, an indoor bathroom, and you flush the toilet by dumping a bucket down the front. We didn't have the standard flush. We always saved the dishwater and bathwater to do the toilet flushing. And this, we also had a bathtub. She says, one by one, our neighbors are taking baths in our tub. Does it seem funny to be treating our visitors to a bath? If Glen Allen has any bathtubs, then we have the only one between there and Palmer, about 160 miles. That just cracked me up when I read that. My mom was an excellent letter writer. She, um, I think, weekly wrote letters back to her family to describe life here. And it's just... And I've been finding photos in old boxes, which is where a lot of these came from. Okay, these, this is a neighbor of ours, Chuck Sutter, who was a guide. He also kept animals for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for whenever animals were orphaned. He had triplet black bears one year. He's had moose calves. He had reindeer calves. He also had a seal at one point. And he always asked us kids to gather whatever it was they could eat. With the bear, I remember, they loved fireweed. So we were picking fireweed and getting it to them. Wood cutting. We did wood cutting year round. Summer, we got the bigger logs and the greener stuff for the winter to give it a year to dry. In the winter, we would cut the, the previously fire killed stuff because it gave the hottest heat for the wood cook stove for my mom, especially when she was baking. She'd mix um, the dry stuff with a little bit of the green stuff to get pro prolonged heat. And sometimes we would supplement that with coal from the coal mines in Sutton. But, you know, any day wood cutting is better with toasted marshmallows. And it wasn't just for us kids. My dad had a sweet tooth too. And here we are, kids worked right alongside the parents. We um, did everything they did, although in smaller quantities because we were littler and couldn't haul quite as much wood. Here, that's my sister getting a haircut. My, one of my mom's vocations before she moved up was a beautician. She was the lady who gave everybody haircuts and did perms and that sort of thing when, when they got to Alaska. Here you see to the left of my sister is the propane cook stove. We got that probably after about five years. All the rest of the cooking is with the wood stove that is directly behind my sister. And if you look just to the left of her head, there's a kind of silver colored tank. That was a water tank that my dad added to the, the piping behind the stove because the stove had a five gallon water circulator on the far end of it. So we could have hot and cold, hot and cool 
running water, but it was all gravity fed, so it didn't come out of the faucet fast. It just came out at the rate that probably nine feet of push from the galvanized tank upstairs would give it. And then to her right, you see the kitchen wood box, which we were tasked with keeping full. Everything was built with a purpose. We're sitting on what looks like a nice bench, but it's actually for holding boots and, and different kinds of shoes and whatnot. We have our Easter baskets and we're really taken aback by the camera from the expressions on our faces. My sister was actually born in the house right in front of that boot box. Glen Allen had a mission hospital and eventually had a mission hospital. They, the doctors would work out of their houses. My dad went to the neighbor up the road who had a phone, called the doctor, and the doctor came and delivered my sister right there in the living room. We also gold mined some. This is back in the Nelchina Eureka territory. It was a summer proposition and us girls had a grand time. We thought that was the best place to be. We would take our weasel back in the woods and thankfully it didn't jump any tracks, which it was very prone to do. There's another view of the gold mining. Most of our groceries came from fishing and hunting and from growing what we could in the garden. Um, Copper River Red Salmon and Copper River Kings were staples around our house. And then uh, before I go on to talk more about them, behind my dad, you'll see a wood pile. There's the generator house and beyond that is the outhouse. That's a very important building, the outhouse. It was even important after we got a real bathroom because with two girls who could hog the bathroom, Sometimes one of us would be flying off the end of the kitchen porch in our flannel nightshirt, heading for the outhouse because the other was taking too long in the bathroom. The old couple across the road called us their TV, and when we would take the mail over, we would uh, get asked, which one of you girls was hogging the bathroom today? Because we saw you flying off the porch. Okay, Copper River Reds. Um, sometimes we would go dip netting. Most often, some of the Atna guys that my dad worked with would loan us the fish wheel for a night. <clears throat> and when the fish were running, we would end up with a half-ton Chevy with a canopy full of salmon. And that meant without refrigeration and freezing capability, you had to get busy right quick with smoking them and canning them. <clears throat> so what my mom would do and I don't know quite how, I wish she was still alive so I could ask her. We had um, two three burner Coleman stoves and she had extra fuel canisters for them. And my sister and I had the job of keeping those fuel canisters filled and pumped up so that the pressure gauges on the canners didn't go down and ruin the batch of fish that was being canned. Plus, without a fire service, there was always the threat of fire and that was that kept us on our toes and basically that was canning fish day and night there's my my dad and Bill Bordeaux from across the road and there's his wife Queenie and my mom hanging on to some of the fish and here's one of the fish wheels that we would use sometimes this was down at Chitna others would be in Gakona and the that's my sister and I standing. We're the short ones. The tall lady with the dark hair behind me is a girl who was in the same grade as me. Um, I was homeschooled and ended up starting third grade when I was six years old. She, on the other hand, went to, went to school when she was much older. So she and I ended up being in the same grade, even though we were about somewhere between five and six years apart in age. It's just how things are when you're growing up. The territory of Alaska had a contract with an outfit called Calvert Course in Baltimore, Maryland, and that's what my mom used for homeschooling us. And apparently we just loved it. We got the first batch of, of things that we needed in the mail, and I, nothing, I wasn't having it. I wasn't waiting until Monday. I wanted school on Saturday, so we did. They sent molding clay, books, paper, art supplies. 
One of the staples in the summertime for all of us was grayling because it was plentiful all around and we would fish it almost every other day. The, that's my sister and one of our neighbors down the road, Paul White. And remember I talked about the double laundry tub that we thawed the moose meat into? Well, that white thing that, the, that they're using for a table, that's the double laundry tub. That served many, many purposes. When we got moose, we needed a place to hang it up. So my dad built a meat house. And on this part, you can see that it's just the screw. Oh, no, that's got, that's got the heavier duty chicken wire. Bears would go right through the regular screen. We ended up having to put heavy duty chicken wire because the bears would go in, wreck the side while they were going in and walk out the door, taking the door off its hinges and they'd take off with a hind quarter. Grizzly bears, not black bears. And there's one of the bears that shouldn't have hung around as long as it did. It ended up getting into the meat house itself. Early on, moose hunting was a novelty because everybody was familiar mostly with deer. I don't think very many of them were in elk country. The very first one we got, my dad built a tripod and attached it to the house and pulled the moose on up on, up on it to finish skinning it. They gut it in the woods, but then bring it in. And then, this is a Thanksgiving Day moose. It ended up, we've always had a September season, and back then, in the 50s and early 60s, there was also a November season. And that meant you had to deal with the moose a little differently. The September stuff got pretty much canned. It got turned into stew meat and browned into, um, ground burger and canned in glass jars. But the, in the second season, you could actually hang the moose and cut it up piecemeal as you needed it. So there's my dad. That was the sled that they pulled behind <clears throat> in the wintertime when they went moose hunting. And that's again, one of the neighbors who was from Michigan, the guy with the dog team. <clears throat> there's my mom and my sister and I. She said Thanksgiving day was they cooked some ducks, but didn't eat them, I think. And here, because our garage was big enough, they ended up getting a lot of moose and had brought them in over a couple of days and the garage was heated. And for this, they ran the generator because you can tell by looking that the light bulb by the post is actually on rather than doing it by Coleman lantern. So, you can also see the fire extinguisher. That's the old fashioned kind that was carbon tetrachloride, which was later deemed to be kind of lethal to the users of it. And then the generator is running. You can see it behind the post. Ordinarily, you would be able to see the slots in the flywheel if, it, if that wasn't spinning, but it's running, it's providing power. And then I'm gonna read some other excerpts because this, this kind of defines what life was like and what everybody just kind of took as matter of fact and did. So this is talking about the hunting episode with a little explanatory. So my dad was working for the Alaska Road Commission helping to build the packs and end of the Denali Highway and he was running a big belly dump and got directed onto a soft shoulder. That thing rolled and the 200 bat pound battery came out and smashed his wrist which meant he was kind of incapacitated for quite a while because he had screws and rods and all kinds of things in it. it. His cast actually looked like a Frankenstein thing for a little while with rods coming out the two sides of it. And it went all the way up to his shoulder. If it itched, my sister and I had the job of grabbing a knitting needle and shoving it down to scratch or up from the hand to scratch. So anyway, <clears throat> Thanksgiving, this is what my mom says. Bruce and Billy, that's one of the guys across the road, took a short hunt before dinner and met up with a head of about 70 moose. That fixed Thanksgiving, we all got our moose, five of us, and gutted them, then started bringing them in. On the first trip, with two moose on the sled, a branch snagged Bruce's parka and pulled him off the seat of the cat. The sled ran over him, two moose and three people on it, and if it wasn't for all his heavy clothing in the snow, he would have been badly hurt. As it was, he only got a few good bruises and was very stiff for a few days, which put him on babysitting detail while I helped with the moose. 
We were busy until that Sunday night, but got them all in, skinned, and quartered and hung. All the moose are about seven miles up in the hill, so it took some, quite some time bringing them in. There was only six hours of daylight, but luckily every night had a bright full moon. On the second trip Friday, the cat broke a key in one of the axles about halfway home and two moose on the sled. So we hiff, hoofed home, three of us that time, and Billy and I gathered tools, lamps, blowtorch, etc. in a couple of pack boards and had to walk back again, all uphill. We were fixing the cat by lamplight, but managed and did get the moose home. Every day was 20 below. We generated enough heat on these safaris, so didn't get cold at all. We did the skinning and butchering in our garage where we have a heating stove, more wood to cut. We had to skin, etc. each load before going back in the hills for the next load. Moose are big. Our garage is too, but not big enough to accommodate working on five moose at one time. For being left out in that cold for two days, the last moose brought in was only froze a little past the knee joint. Their hide and fur is very thick. The hair is about six or eight inches long. This week we thawed out a couple of the hides. Took two days for that and cleaned them up and bundled them off for tanning. Bruce shipped them from town, town being Anchorage, and maybe I'll get my moose hide jacket yet. I've canned 45 quarts of the meat, but of course we'll have to do a lot more than that. So pretty much everybody in that country had to be pretty darn resilient and ready to just go with the flow. You do what you have to do to make life work. Here we are with the moose that we got down the road from the house. There's my youngest sister riding on a hindquarter getting pulled up to the house to thaw. And this is well, a couple years earlier, but remember that sawmill? Well, my dad would put a frozen hindquarter on the sawmill when my mom decided she wanted steaks. And we would have hindquarter sized steaks. What she would do is get the wood cook stove roaring hot, sprinkle it with rock salt and then regular salt and flop the entire steak on top of the wood stove and that would feed us for a couple of days. It was wonderful. And then pre-electricity moose meat grinding. That is the Ford Ferguson tractor with the power takeoff and my dad rigged up a, a grinder to grind the meat and it was fast. Our shopping we, we would go to Anchorage once a year for school clothes and that sort of thing, but most of our shopping was done by ordering through catalogs and through the different large outfits. Our mailman, who came from Palmer, was Cliff Stedman, and he did a lot of shopping. He brought, bought my sister her first pair of shoes. For all of us, he would pick up shoes in Palmer or Anchorage. He'd have a drawing of our foot and he would go shopping. He also picked up things like from Standard Oil Company of California in Palmer, he would pick up Blazo. And it looks like we got 10 five gallon cans of Blazo for $5.85, if, if I'm reading that right, and hauling it was a dollar. So schooling. In the beginning, we were homeschooled, and when the government finally decided there would be a school close enough, for us it was 25 miles, for others it was 40 miles one way to get to school. And our very first school bus was a three-seater station wagon with the back seat facing backwards. And our bus drivers were pretty bright people. They would have comic books and snacks for us, especially if we were good, and they would leave the lights on in the car so we could work and do homework. And then we hit the big time. We got a 16 passenger regular school bus. And this guy, Joe Kretzler, also owned a lodge called Musubu, so everybody knew him as Joe Musubu. But that's what we used for school for many, many years. They would go as far as 50 miles away with this bus. And then for other people, they would come from Kenny Lake and Paxson, which are kind of in the same realm of 25 to 50 miles away. There's another picture of our barrel stove in the, regarding water. In the wintertime, a lot of times we would shovel snow to do laundry because the water from Glen Allen was kind of hard and the snow, when it melted, was very soft water. So all those cases of canned goods, my mom would cut the tops off of them and they would get attached to a toboggan and my sister and I's daily job several times a day 
was to shovel those full of snow and dump them into that copper boiler that's sitting on the wood stove. And we would have other containers, aluminum wash tubs and whatnot, sitting on the kitchen stove and then on the floor beside the stove. And that's how we would get enough water to do laundry and dishes and that sort of thing to supplement having to drive to Glen Allen or to one of the lakes down the road to, to get water. We also had to take care of pretty much all of our mechanics ourselves. What you see here is the barrels and hoses in, um, this one is a trailer. They would be either on the sled or the trailer. Those are for getting water. And then we also repaired our own tires. When us girls were learning to drive, my dad wouldn't let us out on the road unless we knew how to not just change a tire, but also repair a tire. And that was back when they were tires with tubes. So we had to learn how to patch the tubes. And we had to learn how to do split rim tire repair as well. So we got to learn a lot, a little about a lot of things. Some we were better at than others. Um, and then in 1963, we actually got real honest to goodness electricity. And those are the guys from Copper Valley Electric Association hooking up our power. That was a momentous day. And then wouldn't you know it, the next Christmas, power was off on Christmas morning and my dad would not have it. Never mind that we had been spent every Christmas um, in our lives without lights on the Christmas tree, but because we had electricity, he went down to the garage and started the power plant so we could have lights on the Christmas tree and we're going, Daddy, what for? Why? But he wanted it to be, so we had to wait. And that's tough when you're a kid and wanting to open presents. Okay, we also had a herd of buffalo that were around and they would come and get into the garden and just infuriate people. Back then we had party lines and it wasn't, um, it wasn't a standard ring. We were, I think we were two shorts and two longs. If there was a ring that was four longs, it meant everybody on the party line was supposed to pick up because there was an emergency of some sort. It could mean that somebody had a fire or somebody had a wreck. It also could mean the buffalo are coming because all the guys would load shotgun shells with rock salt to encourage them to keep going. Also what you see there, there's our outhouse behind the people, but we seem to live in the Mecca of porcupines and our dog would get into the porcupines like crazy. So we would, we would make them go away. Target practice. I'm not sure if I've ever heard of buffalo being in Alaska before. Oh yeah. Yeah, there are herds um, across the Copper River and Delta, both, and then Farewell Burn. And that one was part of the, the copper herd that ended up migrating to across the Copper River. So, yeah. And I tell you, they were on our, uh, they were surrounding the house one day when the herd was big, when there were about 30 of them. And my dad had said, when I knock on the door, I need some more of the, the shotgun shells with rock salt. So I heard noise on the, on the living room porch and I opened the door and I opened it right into a buffalo's butt. It was standing on the porch. I shut that door so fast. So here, we lived, I found out years later, kind of on a migratory area of black bears and grizzly bears, because most places have one or the other, not necessarily both. So we had way more bear entertainment than anybody would ever want to have. Every summer we had bears around doing different things. Well, the one that's called the glacier bear, that one was on the porch across the road trying to get into the house while the lady was taking a nap. My dad saw it and ended up shooting it. And as it turned out, that was a glacier bear in the interior and ended up actually being in the Smithsonian of all things. These are bears from down the road. Um, they were on the hill right behind the folks at Atlasta House and all of us played on that hill back there. Uh, they, I kind of think if I'm remembering this correctly, they chased the kids down the hill so John White ended up shooting the mom and the two cubs. And then the bear, that's Queenie Bordeaux, our neighbor across the road and her daughter Marcy, who was at Atlasta House. That's the bear that was on our dump pile. My dad shot it, went with the clee track and the sled to get it, took the sides off the sled, rolled the bear on, and 
Paul and Claire White from up the road were with us, Marcy's kids. And we jumped on top of the bear to get a ride back to the house. And a, pff, about a third of the way back up to the house, that bear started moving and started standing up. Us four kids levitated off, <laughs> off that bear and shot past the clee track. My dad figured out something was up by the way we just took off like, like anything. We were just booking it. And luckily he had the rifle with him. So he, he stopped the cat, turned around and looked and went, oh, shot the bear again. Finished it off that time. And there, this was a wolf that was also hanging around. And my mom didn't like that with little kids and, and a dog and a cat. And it was being strange also, trying to, it was playing around the porch of the lady next door. So she shot it and it turned out when it got tested that it was rabid. So it was probably a good thing she got rid of that. And there she is hunting herself. Hunting, yeah, she's reading a book. Um, we also did a lot of ice fishing. Uh, we got burbot from Tulsona Lake at, that's about six miles down the house. That one would have been a record if we had taken it in to be weighed and processed the way it should have been. We ate it instead. And there's a, this is me and my mom waiting at um, Mentasta, which is up the Toke Road. Every year we would go spear whitefish. They were pretty good to eat. And what that taught, what growing up like that taught me and my sisters is we learned to be active from the get-go. So we went fishing and on float trips. This next picture I just love. There's my mom and her granddaughter. And the granddaughter wants to be just like grandma. So she's got her cap on and her, her uh, fishing rod in the water. And the next one is rowing on the Gulcana River. I'm just going to zip through some of these because there's a lot of float trip stuff. Well, some are on the Denali Highway, some are on the Gulcana River. That young fellow in the blue coat showing off his silver salmon is my nephew Eric. That's a trip we took on the Good News River. Here I'm rowing on the Gulcana River. There's my nephew having a nap. He looks like he's one of the bags. But that shows the amount of stuff that we would take on the river. Because sometimes we would do a nine-day float trip and never see another person. It was just fabulous. Another scenery shot of the rafts. One more. Those kids were going on float trips by the time they were four years old. And that's what they know. They just think everybody should do float trips. That's a rainbow at Stephen Lake Lodge. There's my niece with her Gulcana rainbow. Here I am kingfishing on the Gulcana. Um, that rod is mine, but the reel belonged to a friend of mine. And I was going to change the line on my reel because it was worn and I knew it. And he said, oh, use my reel. It'll fit your rod. It'll be fine. So yeah, it was fine until I got a nice strong salmon pulling on it. And then all of a sudden the reel jumped off. So there I am with the rod in my right hand, the reel in my left hand, the, the salmon is in fast current and I'm yelling, Tinker, get over here. Twice that reel jumped off, but I got the salmon, landed it. We also still dip net. That's down at Chitna, Copper River Reds. My sister and I are doing synchronized salmon gutting. Fishing down in Homer. And then as, um, as a result, I guess, of growing up on the homestead, I ended up becoming a big game guide, guiding for moose and bear, sheep and caribou and getting to see a lot of scenery. So I'm going to zip through these. And you'll see that having malfunctions on the homestead taught us how to handle malfunctions when we were on the, in the woods on our own. So there's the base camp. And you can see the, the truck with the bombardier on it. Here we are getting ready to take off for the season. And usually that's a 20 to 25 day season. And pretty much you take all the gear with you for the entire time. That's tent camps food, cook stoves, extra fuel, you name it. We wouldn't necessarily take much water because we would find springs to get it from or get it from a lake and just add some Clorox to it to make sure it was sterilized. There I am repacking some food stuff. There's my mom with a caribou that she got out in hunting season when she was 65. 
you do a lot of sitting and glassing on hills. And one of the things that my mom always did when we were going hunting when we were kids is kids can get bored pretty quickly. She would, we all had binoculars, some better than others, but she would also tell us she'd have say, girls, put your fingers up to your eyes. Now adjust your eyes so you can see moose and look real hard. So that's how we learned to look for moose. And there I am spotting. Things sometimes came by airdrop. If we ran out of potatoes, we could, the pilot would fly over and we had radio contact with them to say, we need grease for the machine, or we need an air filter for the machine, or we're about out of potatoes. We need more candy bars. We had hunters from other countries. These guys are from Germany and they have a lot of traditions that they do here. I grew up pretty much hunting for meat. It was interesting to learn about trophy hunting. And then these fellows took it a step farther. They have traditions when they um, actually successfully kill an animal. They hand some greenery back and forth and ultimately put it in the animal's mouth for it to have its last meal for, as its spirit leaves. And then just some me and some hunters, my birthday moose, sheep hunting up in the Brooks Range. That sheep was, I think, 41 and a half and the biggest sheep to come out of the Brooks Range that year. Camp life, more camp life. We actually hauled a cotton pick and six burner propane stove out in the woods. And it actually helped because one year we had 10 hunters and, is that right? No four hunters and six workers. So having the extra cooking space was very handy. There's the inside of one of the cabins that no longer exists. And I have to say, I hold the record for birthday cakes being flung out of airplanes because for 25 years, plus or minus, my birthday is at the beginning of September and that's how I got my birthday cake. Um, they often got decorated back at Tangle Lakes and the, the pink was made with pink Kool-Aid. The green willows, willow, the leaves you see are actually willow leaves from some of the trees. Um, different ways of camping, Arctic ovens and, and blue tarps. And there we are getting water from a spring. Some of the best meals ever, caribou tenderloin and fresh caught Arctic grayling. That, by the way, is a Pampered Chef pan on a an old, old, old Coleman single burner stove. That's a crew. Most of those guys are from Sweden and we're still friends with them. The end of a hunting season. And this is one of the guys who flies the meat. He's trying to figure out how to get all those pieces into his aircraft. And there he is back at Tangle Lakes. So I mentioned being mechanically inclined and being able to do things. Well, you look at those big rigs and you think they can go just about anywhere, and they can, but things happen. Sometimes to the machine, sometimes you fall in a mud hole. Well, big stucks and breakdowns. I'm not quite sure what happened here. I'm thinking a stick got stuck in the track and they were having to get it out. It's not really stuck, it just looks terrible. And it's, it's soupy. In the areas where there have been trails that everybody uses for years and years and years, they've gotten kind of messy. If you make your own trail with those big rigs, they put down about 17 and a half pounds per square foot, I think, of pressure. I don't know if I have that right. Anyway, they put down less pressure than one person's footstep walking. And that on the way into the woods was a totally benign piece of trail and it was a hot season, it, uh, the permafrost melted, and there we are in a mud hole. The bottom picture is we broke the axle on the trailer, found out it, the axle was cracked. It had probably been broken for who knows how many years, but with three moose in the trailer, it gave up the ghost when we were going cross country instead of staying on the trail. And once again, travel to the rescue, we offloaded all of our workers gear and moose and left it in the woods and the two hunters who needed to catch the ferry to Juneau, we put all their gear and moose into the back of the machine and we had five of us riding across the front of it instead of three across the front and two standing up. And then we had a sideways snowstorm. So we had to put in the plywood doors and tarp ourselves in going cross country because we weren't on trail. 
And finally we gave up when it was getting dark. We said we better make camp and just make do with what we have. So he found the one lone spruce tree in the area, tied one end of the tent to it, the other end of the tent to the machine, and cut a bunch of spruce brows, made dinner for the night, and off we went the next morning. We went 100 yards and found the trail. We could have made it all the way to the road had we known. This is the year that we took the, um, the cook stove in, and you can see there that the trailer has the smaller wheels, and you can see how it buries itself in the, in the muck and yuck. And then the next one is both machines that were going in that year lost their hydraulics and didn't have reverse. Something happened with the lines on the way in, and this machine happened to tip on its side. There's my nephew. I flew in that year. I missed all of this, but it's a pretty spectacular trip. Between the two machines, making wide circles and going slow, they managed to get where they needed to go. And then we flew out and got pieces, parts, once we figured out what the issue was and put the machines back together. Um, eventually, we s stopped the guiding business and sold the bombardiers and ended up with six wheelers. And I just like this shot. It's a nice scenery shot. Um, I think my mom's letter writing had a hold on me because I ended up writing a book. I went to, I got my bachelor's of education from the University of Alaska before there was a UAF or UAA or UAS. And then in 93, I went back and got a master's in professional writing. And as part of that, they, I needed a graduate project and it became doing um, a book on my hunting experiences to talk some about growing up on the homestead and that sort of thing. And then in 1995, Fish and Game started to becoming an outdoors woman program and I got asked to be on the steering committee by Kathy Harms, who was the person tasked with getting the program up and running and developing it. Um, a bunch, I didn't know her at the point, at that point, but a bunch of our uh, mutual friends kept saying, you need to get Sharon. You need to get Sharon. You need to get Sharon. So she did, and the rest is history. I still teach at Becoming an Outdoors Woman, and she's retired, but she still goes in MC. So I'm just gonna zip through these so you can see the kinds of things that happen. They're talking about women answering the call of the wild, field dressing, introduction to big game hunting, talking about everything that you need learning how to look through binoculars and spotting scopes. I've learned that a lot of people don't know how to do that. And that was one of the key things for a lot of the ladies was knowing how to not just quickly look across a hillside, but pick something, make a grid. Doesn't matter what direction you go, but go slowly and mark things that look un unusual so you can go back to them and and relook at it because that stump that you've been looking at might suddenly turn into a moose when it stands up. It's interesting because these are things that I learned on the homestead that I was able to translate to all of these ladies at Becoming an Outdoors Woman. Because and in a lot of ways, I didn't know what I knew until I started teaching at, the, at these sessions and people started asking questions. So here we're doing a hands-on map reading and regulations exercise. How do you look at the regulations, know what you can hunt, and then figure out where you can go hunt and what would be a good place to go hunt by the terrain. Showing the different gear. Also do field dressing, which is completely hands-on. Fishing game gets an elk or a reindeer and we field dress it. We try to mostly explain, but sometimes you have to do a little show and tell. I'm talking about the kind of saw that we're using and why. One of the key things is mark your tag the minute you get an animal. We also taught Backpack Chef. A lot of people have issues with food and don't necessarily like the mountain house kinds of things. Well, this teaches how to make food for yourself. People can be diabetic or allergic to certain things and this allows you to make your own food. So there we are. And these are some other, the other classes they do is um, Dutch Oven Chef, Map and Compass, Trapping and Skinning, Fly Tying, Winter Quincy Building, Ice Fishing, How to Cut Down a Tree Safely, Dog Mushing, Shotgun, 
archery. And then because of my experiences in growing up where I did, I ended up being on Alaska's Board of Game for a couple of years, which is essentially Alaska's regulatory authority that makes the regulations that we all hunt and fish by. This is our crew then in 2006. Mike Flegel from Anchorage was the chair, Ron Somerville vice chair from Juneau, me from Fairbanks, Ben Grusendorf from Sitka, Ted Spraker from Soldatna, Cliff Judkins from Wasilla, and Carl Morgan from Antioch. One of the things that we did was the experimental moose management area, predator control project. We relocated um, bears from McGrath um, because their moose calves weren't making it to adulthood at all and their moose population was pretty much tanking. They thought they would move, well, they were bets on whether there would be any grizzlies. Some people said, ah, maybe five. I don't remember the number, but it was a lot more than five. And the black bears that they moved was, gosh, around 100. There were way more than anybody ever anticipated. You need to check with Fish and Game to know those statistics exactly. I'm speaking very off the cuff. But here are a couple of the bears, the grizzly bears, the big grizzly bears, and you can see in the, in the bottom photo, everybody's just kind of standing there looking at that bear going, oh my. There's me and one of the biologists. And when I flew back to town from that project, we actually dropped two bears off along the way. So with guiding, with Backpack Chef, was sometimes I have cooked for the Alaska Trapping Association trapping schools. I go right back to my mom's list and keeping track. There's menus, inventories, keeping track of all the receipts, lists. This is an inventory from one of the hunting camps. And why we have the inventory is there are so many people to feed. A float trip list. This is the pre-planning list. Who's going to bring what and how much of it. Here we are making lunch. A lot of that is the, the tomatoes stay whole, but the rest of the sandwiches are pieced up, ready to put together so you don't have to waste a lot of time. And basically, a lot of what my sisters and I do in life now is a result of how we grew up on the homestead. Um, you kind of think outside the box and there's a wonderful lake shot. And so basically here, we learn to be resilient, to be flexible, to be open to new things because that's all we did was learn new things, it seemed like. To learn from our mistakes, ask questions, Rube Goldberg it sometimes. In fact, that Rube Goldberg it, that saw I was demonstrating in the Becoming an Outdoors Zoom picture, it's a three-piece thing plus the blade. You put it together, it's got a hook on one end and a catch and a wing nut on the other. Well, the catch on the end of the wing nut broke and we needed the saw, so we figured out that um, the pop top from a, the, the little V8 can worked perfectly. We duct taped, the tuck, huh, duct taped that thing on and it's still functioning today. And that was probably in 1997 plus or minus. We did get the replacement part and it travels in the, in the knife, in the saw holder, but you know, Rubo Goldberg it sometimes. You learn to think and plan ahead and that is definitely true in doing all of the, the guiding and the cooking and the backpack chef classes, all the gear that you need to take for teaching at Becoming an Outdoors Woman. For one of my sisters, it was planning all of her PE classes ahead. For my other sister, it was doing everything she needed to do, being a single mom, getting herself and her kids through college and then in her work afterwards. Um, be organized and but not anal, know you've got a flex. Help your friends and neighbors, laugh a lot, and always be ready to take that hard left. And that's just kind of how we've lived life. Done.